Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my honour to welcome you all back to uh, the Leadership Speaker Series uh, here at Blue Mountains. Uh, we're in for a little bit of a, 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 a treat today. Um, we have joining us today Casper uh, Schmidt, uh, the Chief Operating Officer at Veriu Hotels. Um, it's over 20 years experience in the in the hospitality industry. Uh, you talk about having a, a balanced, holistic uh, a, a, and a holistic leadership style uh, for business management. You've listed emotional intelligence as, as one of your, your strongest assets, uh, and you view yourself as a goal-orientated motivator, people and talent uh, developer, uh, and a great driver of revenue. A strategic operator, talent uh, and team development is a fundamental part of, uh, of your DNA, uh, with a great time spent creating, aligning, or, and organizing elements uh, of the organization. You also have on here, and I really like this line, you wanted to put a dent uh, in, in, into the hospitality universe. So we'll definitely go into that. But ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to put your hands together and, and welcome Casper. Uh, so we're going to go on a bit of a journey today about, about you and, and a little bit about the industry. But yeah. I want to talk about your kind of the early days for you. And I guess where, where did this, this passion and this drive to, to be in the hospitality industry come from? Oh look, I, I think it's it's always sort of been in the blood and the family. There was a, always a lot of traveling going on with my parents and and my grandparents and so on. So I sort of early on thought, you know, I really liked the, the, the you know travel industry. Yeah. So so that's really where it started. You're um, clearly not Australian. No, no I'm not Australian. <laughs> no, I can't hide the accent. The accent um, is back from, obviously from Denmark, um, where I lived, um, yeah, for a long, long time till I was eighteen. Did you work in the industry while you were in Denmark? I did. I actually yeah. started a chef's apprenticeship. Oh, wow. And never finished. <laughs> um, not my familiar. choice, but uh, look, I, um, I had an opportunity to go on the other side of the pants um, and actually go and uh, really essentially surf. Um, and um, I thought back then that was really interesting that I actually made tips. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I sort of never really looked back. So I did more than two years of chefing, but then, yeah, I just started waiting tables and and mm. made my way up from there. Yeah. What made you want to be a chef? Or what, what pushed you into that apprenticeship? My mom's cooking. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. My, my mom, I always think, you know, we always say, oh, my mom makes the best food, but my mom does. <laughs> um, uh, so yes, yeah, so I was just really interested in that. And, and yeah, look, I, I still cook now with my son. And, you know, so yeah, look, I, it's always been in the blood. So we just- Wow, that's, yeah, that, that's amazing. So mom kind of, motivated you to get, get into the industry? Yeah, look, I mean, she didn't motivate me. She just said, if you got to follow your heart, that's and fine. I really liked the food, so I thought, that's great. Cool. You know, yeah, go and cook some food and eat it. But it wasn't working like that. I had to cook the food for other people, obviously. <laughs> so what was it like being a, I guess, being a, a young chef in Denmark? Was it kind of, you, you thought, yeah, I like this cooking gig, it sounds all really good, and all of a sudden you're in the kitchen, now you're cooking for other people. What was what was um, that like? It's a lot tougher than I thought yeah. it would be. Yeah, you right. Know, um, a lot more pressure. Um, I think the prep time. I think I started when I started. All I was given was just a bucket of onions, and um, yeah, you learned the fast way, I guess, yep. with that. And yep. you know, then it was peeling potatoes, and then was, it was cutting all the, you know, mastering all the cuts. You know, your juliennes and your bournois and mm -hmm. you know, and so on. Your poin, do all these different things, right? And I thought, oh, this this is never going to end. But I think sort of I had a really good head chef and an executive chef, and they sort of got me to look at plating quite early on, and I, I yep. really I really liked that part. So yeah, it's 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 followed me in my career really. Fantastic. Mm. And I guess you then saw the light and thought you're going to get to the other side of the pass. Um, and and what was what was that like? You're now having to talk to customers. Yeah, but that, I like that. I, yeah. I, I like to talk a lot. Good. So that that also runs in the family. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, look, I mean, I, uh, it was sort of pure coincidence. There was a day where they, they were really short on, on, on team members in the front and, and I was off. And so they called me and said, oh, do you think you can carry some trays and help out? And I ended up looking after a couple of tables and I really yep. enjoyed it. And they were like, you should work here more, here's some tips. And I was like, mm, okay, that's wow. nice. Wow, yeah. okay. And how long did you do that for? About a year and a half. Yep. Yeah. And then I, I guess what, what, what drove you to get into hotels? Talk to me about that kind of, that journey. Um, what was your? What was I your think first the, gig? the hotel, the hotel thing was was a you know going traveling um, and then experiencing hotels while traveling and then um, having quite a few sort of family friends that would recommend where to go and see if, you know I was traveling. So um, we I remember being in Hong Kong and 
having a small you know job at um, at Deakin Sports Bar at um, at the Excelsior Hotel, which is actually still there, uh, part of the Mandarin Oriental Group, and and that was really the start of everything. It was like you know this is cool. I could really see myself in this industry, um, and then actually I, I came came to Australia to study after that. So, what was your first job in a hotel? In a hotel was a bar back. Yeah, it's a bar back. Yeah, I was just cleaning beer glasses. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> Get your ice. You know. Did you actually cut, en- cut enjoy fruit. that? Yeah, I didn't mind it. No. Okay. You know, there was always something happening, and it was you know it was a pretty hit, full on bar, sports bar. So you had you had all the rugby seven teams there, and you had you know you had a lot of things happening. Yep. So yeah, it was fun. Okay. Yeah. So you flew halfway across the world to study to study hospitality. Yeah. I actually it, I. I I said to my mom and dad, I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to go to Switzerland. I'm going to fly to Zurich and I'm going to study at Neuchâtel. Mm-hmm. And uh, then about three or four weeks out, uh, my, f- uh, my best friend, um, he said, I'm going to go to Blue Mountains and it's a sister school to the one in Switzerland. Yep. She should join me. I said, yeah, that's great. Let's do it. So I called. We had the interview and, and I was accepted. And so I, I remember, still remember my mom's face when I, when I said to her, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm to change of plans. I'm going to Sydney. She goes, no, you're going to Zurich. I said, no, I'm going <laughs> to Sydney. So... That was it. Yes. Yeah. So what you just said, Mum? That's it. I'm I'm, I'm off. I'm and, off to and, Sydney, and, and I'm off. And uh, yeah, that was it. I mean, she'd be okay with with Zurich. She was I mean, all right. How far it was is Zurich? Two hours from... flight, you know. So yeah, well, so now it was 24 hours instead. But I don't know. It just something r- felt right about about getting out here. And I always remember reading, you know, growing up about Australia and all the, you know, all the scary animals and whatever. And I thought that's great. <laughs> Let's go to Australia and yep. see what it's all about. <laughs> and uh, yeah, arrived and um, yeah, I've been here on and off for the last 20 years. Wow. So. Okay. So as an international student, your, your, your first kind of exposure to, to, to Australia, tell, tell me about the first couple of weeks in, in, in Oz. What was it like? Well, very different. It was very relaxed. We were up in Lura and yeah, it was, it was just very different. And for me, the first sort of real private school environment up in Denmark, all the schools are more or less public. So you don't have uniforms, you know, it's way more casual. Mm-hmm. I remember being, you know, arriving and they had got my measurements for the uniform completely wrong, which is not hard because I'm pretty tall. <laughs> but I remember the jacket sitting up here and the pants was up there. Oh, and I remember no. Val Cook saying to me, this is hopeless, mate. We need, we need to get you down to Sydney <laughs> to get, get you some stuff. So, so that was what happened in, in week two or something. But yep. yeah, look, it, it was a different experience. And I also remember it was really hard for me to really actually understand the Australians to begin with. And I always thought my English was pretty good. but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were just talking really fast and slang, and I was like, okay, yeah, I'll get it eventually. So, so most of the students in this room could definitely empathise. Yeah, with I the, think with the I think so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're now in Australia, and I guess tell me about how different the Australian hospitality industry was to what you you grew up with in, in Europe. What oh, the big differences? Look, it's just way more relaxed mm-hmm. here. It's it's like the attention to service back then, and I think it's improved over the many years, but it was just very relaxed, and it was almost like you had to sort of wave down a waiter to get them to take your order, and, you know, mm. um, they wouldn't ask necessarily how you wanted your steak cooked or, you know, if you wanted ice or, it, like, anything like that. It was like, it was just very relaxed. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that was sort of my first sort of, I guess, experience with it. I um I did my first placement in Melbourne actually at okay. uh, with the Hilton back yep. back then it's uh, it was Hilton on the park which is now I think it's a Pullman on the park but mm-hmm. um yeah I remember just yeah starting from scratch again I, I was a I, I was hired to set up the buffets and they had these massive buffets there and I worked there for seven eight months and just moved around in the hotel but always came back to the buffet because in the end you know I was the champion of setting up this buffet <laughs> from four in the morning you know I knew where everything was going so. Uh, but that was, yeah, again, it was just different. It's different, um, different atmosphere. And did you, I guess, did you struggle with, with the difference? I mean, you're used to a certain service level and a certain oh. style of service, and all of a sudden you come to a different country and you think, hang on a minute, these guys are almost kind of not here, but not here. Well, I think, look, it, it worked. You know, it was, it's, yeah. the hotel's just beside the MCG, so it's very, very busy. You know, we have yeah. a grand final, New Year's Eve, all these things. and somehow it just worked. Um, okay. There was a lot of people there and there's a lot of people that had been there for a long time. So I was sort of just trying to sort of fit in into yeah. the team, which was fine, but it was a challenge. Um, I think I probably I, 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 I would work two different departments when I was there. So I would do an AM shift and then yeah. I'll do a PM shift in another uh, another department in the hotel. And the, the, st- the staff of the team there, they're like, you're crazy, why are you doing all these hours? I'm like, well, I, I want to experience it. I want to yeah. try something new, so yeah. So the service was different. What about Aussie customers? What were we like? 
Um, <laughs> be honest. Look, look good in general, but you yeah. always have your, you know, you have you have your special, <laughs> special customers that yep. you know. I remember we had a we had a we had a couple that would come in for the Sunday buffet and they would pay always pay cash, and um, the lady would bring like a thermal ba bag with her, and 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 her husband would go up and he would just <laughs> go to the buffet like <laughs> twenty times, thinking, how do they eat all this food? I just don't understand. And then she would actually sit and she would put all She'd the food in the thermal the bag. bag below the table, <laughs> underneath the table. And it was always, they always come up when they would leave and they would give me like $5 in, 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 in tip. And I was like, it took me a while to work out, it took me a couple of Sundays. And I, I, so I said to the manager, I said, they're actually stealing the food. And uh, Mark says, who's actually an alumni from here as well. Oh, wow. He said, um, he said, I guess they've been here for 20 years. We just let them do it. It's just part of it. Just deal with it. It's okay. <laughs> it's fine. It's not a problem. So. Yeah. So you spent some time in, in, in F and B. Yeah. Um, when, when, when did you kind of go? Hang on a minute. I think this there's there's a career here for me, and I, I want to start moving up up the food chain and, and, and really getting in, into management. Look, I think uh, in my second year, when I did my second placement, uh, I went up to uh, up to Sunshine Coast and worked for the Hyatt, which is no longer there, but Hyatt yeah. Regency used to be a fantastic resort and. And, and I started in front office there, and, and then at the same time, I, I started working to begin with casually uh, in a fine dining restaurant in Noosa. Mm. And I thought, you know, that that whole you know drive that was there with the guys at Hyatt, and then you know this privately owned restaurant where the owners were very, very focused on getting chefs hats, mm -hmm. uh, really enticed me to really sort of lift the level. Yep. Um, and yeah, I I ended up supervising that restaurant and and working at the same time at Hyatt. And it was just yeah, fabulous. We ended up getting two hats in that restaurant. Wow. So, yeah. So two placements outside of Sydney. Yes. Yes. Hat. Why? <laughs> Actually, it's a very good reason. Yeah. The Olympics. I I I, I was there in '99, and yep. the Olympics started, and we were basically told from school, okay, you need to be out of the campus because we're filling this with bands and people that's going to be at the Olympics, and they're going to live up yeah, here. So right. we're like, okay, where are we going to go? <laughs> so um, I thought, look, great that the Olympics were here in Sydney. I actually, so I traveled back to be at some of the you know uh, competitions and to, to look at some of the things. And yep. I thought that was great, but I was actually really happy to be out of Sydney because it was so chaotic. It was, so, yeah. it was I, remember, I remember working in, in, in the CBD in, in, uh, during the Olympics. It was, it was fun, yeah, but yeah. there were just people everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, how we kind of motivate our current students to get out of Sydney, just someone's too busy in Sydney and go, go somewhere mm. else, right? Yeah. Okay, cool, mm. noted. Um, I guess, what was next? So you're now almost, you've done your second placement. You've, yeah, you've done, done some ama two amazing, yeah, two amazing some, placements. Some, some really good placements. Um, and I yeah, came back to school and <laughs> did finish my 30 and, and then was, was asked if I was interested in, in completing the, the BA back then. There was a the degree. There was another six months on top of that. And there was only the second year was available at, yep. at, at Blue Mountain in yep. Lura. So I thought, yeah, you know, why not? Yep. That's, that sounds interesting. So, so yeah, completed that. Did your bachelor's and then what? Well, then uh, I thought, okay, um, I'm, I'm, I was hopeful that uh, immigration will be very gracious towards me and, and, and grant me a visa, but <laughs> they were not. Um, so, so we were basically told, you graduate, that's great. Now you can leave for two years and do some, you know, experience work somewhere, and then you can, you know, apply for potentially your permanent residency then. Yep. And that's what I did. So I, I yeah, I... I, I basically packed up and uh, we did a we did a bit of, did a bit of traveling and I did come back on a tourism visa where I could work six months and and, and I did that, continued uh, working for the owners that I'd worked for up in Noosa mm -hmm. for a while, helped them set up another restaurant, um, and then we went to the, to the states, um, and again I mean it's all about networking guys I guess but in year one I, I was interviewed by a, a, a form, uh, an alumni as well Charles Young who. Um, who is now my mentor and has been my mentor for the last 20 years, but wow. um, he, he was in the state, he worked for, uh, for Marriott, um, and he, um, he just, and Hilton, and, and, and he somehow, yeah, we were in contact on, on Hotmail, I guess it was back then, yeah, right. snow phones, uh, or mobiles, et cetera, and, and yeah, he was just like, Casper, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm not really sure, we have to leave Australia, and, and then it ended up with, with us going to Key West, so he, he got us, uh, got my, my girlfriend back then an a, 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 a internship yep. um, and um, I ended up getting an internship with Hilton, a GM internship, 
uh, where I basically followed him around for 18 months. So A, a GM's internship? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's, so that's just through your, your, your network was, with the was, alumni? That was through, through, through him. Um, and um, yeah, so we, we flew to Miami, had a couple of weeks in Miami and did some training. And then we went to Key West and Jeez. we worked. And we worked hard. <laughs> so what was, what, was, what was it like? Well, it, yeah, it was very different. Training was amazing, very full on, um, very detailed, all departments. Yep. Um, one of the things I'd said to Charlie uh, was, look, I really want to join, but I don't want to work food and beverage. I really want to learn the rooms part. That's mm -hmm. really important for me. So mm -hmm. um, I started um, in reception. I did night audit, uh, did duty management, and then uh, an assistant manager uh, was sort of coming and going. So I took some of those shifts and, and worked as a duty manager um, for about about six months. Yep. And then I had a, f a call, a phone call back then. I was home and there was a phone call and it, it was the, it was the uh, director of operations and he said, you gotta, you got to come to Charlie's office tomorrow at 7 a.m. I was like, wow, okay. okay, that's a bit serious. Yep. I'll be there. Um, and I turn up and Charlie says to me, Caswell, we've had an issue happen and um, the restaurant manager is gone and I need you to take over the restaurant. And I was like, okay, right. interesting. Because um, all of a sudden a, your path's gone from F&B into rooms. Yeah, yeah. And now they're, they're asking to now go they're back to me back. Um, this is a massive restaurant. There's 350 seat underwater in Key West. We have cruise ships outside docking every day and yep. yeah, it was just really, really busy. Uh, but yeah, so I, I said, okay, we got to fix it. So I went in there and I worked, and I worked a lot. So no, um, no, no reservations, no nothing. It's like you know what, I'm just going to jump in head first and, and I, see where this takes me. Yeah, I think I think that's always been my sort of style that you know you yeah. just got to just got to go for it, and you got to fix fix what you can when you when you're there in the moment, and, and then yeah. you can you know have a chat about it afterwards. So yeah, wow. so 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 I did that and. And really actually enjoyed it, but you know, a massive department. You know, we had we had over 100, 100 team members in that department. There were days where we were, you know, we were serving. If, if the cruise ships had had bad food, you would have, you know, people lining up at 6 a.m. and they'll be eating Ex Benedict until like 8 p.m., you know. Wow. And yeah, oh it, it was God. just crazy. You know, you just had an onflow of people. And um, yeah, I learned really fast. Uh, we, I remember being in, uh, on the line in, 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 the, in the kitchen, and I remember at one given time, uh, we, had, we had more than 250 tickets hanging, and yeah, expediting, like, you know, having, we had 16 chefs on the line, and it, it was just crazy, crazy. Oh. But, you know, got through it and, and really learned a lot from it, so. Now, aren't you glad at that point you thought, you know what, that, that change from being a chef to now being at the, the front of the restaurant, I don't have to cook any of these 250 well, tickets. I just have to really expedite them out to yeah, the restaurant. Yeah, but when you're a restaurant manager and you have people, chefs not turn up, then uh, you also go in behind the stove you and did? you start, oh yeah, you, absolutely. You put the I mean, I remember on. we were doing 20 liters of hollandaise sauce <laughs> in the morning, oh, you know, oh my God. because you had, you knew you were, what you were gonna go through. Yep. And then a chef will come in late and you go, oh, mate, where you been? Oh, I was out last night. I was like, great, great. You won't be doing that again. Yeah, you know? absolutely. <laughs> but um, yeah, no. Really, that's the thing know, with the states. I mean, it's it's all just massive scale compared yeah, to, to what scale. we have here. Yeah, no, it is, and it's um, even though you know the, the resort itself was you know only on less than two hundred rooms, but the only five star resort in Key West, like yep. uh, you know, highly rated, and it had a they also owned uh, the owner had a private island outside called Sunset Key Guest Cottages, and As high, you do. high clientele. You know, you had thirty seven cottages there. They're you know selling at three thousand dollars a night, so. You had some really selective clientele that would come there um, and utilize both facilities. So yeah, it so was that's three thousand dollars a night back in the early two thousand. Back in the early two thousand. Yeah. So yeah, it was uh, a lot yeah, more than yeah, what, a lot more than than what than it's now. worth yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess what was the, the the biggest challenge for you managing managing that restaurant? Um, I think uh, we had uh, I think twenty one or twenty two different nationalities. Yep. And not everyone, you know, the English wasn't very good. And, yep. you know, so you just had to try and sort of, you know, uh, speak to them in whatever language that was possible, yep. translate. And, you know, my Spanish is very broken. I only, you know, learned at school. So I was like, okay, well, I learned, I learned a lot of, of Spanish very fast. Yep. So, yeah, it was, it, was, it was good. But that was probably the biggest challenge. And then I guess the philosophy, I guess, in the States from a service perspective, too, is that people are not paid very well. They, they don't really sort of care. They all, all of them really bank on their tips. Yep. So that was a different mentality again. So, yeah, different. 
So what was after after that? Because I mean, for me, it, it's I mean, I'm in Key West. I don't want to leave for a long no, time. No, I don't want to. I didn't want to leave. Yeah. Uh, we look, um, <laughs> I think uh, after the 18 months, we we were offered a, a B1 visa, which is a sort of a three year visa, mm-hmm. and we we're just like, we just want to sort of go somewhere different and, and see something different. So okay. we ended up going to New Zealand. So Australia to the US, <laughs> back to New, I mean, yeah. why New Zealand? Um, I had a friend. You said you want to. Yeah, not many no, people no. Want Look, to um, a friend of mine had a restaurant. He'd opened a restaurant. I used to work with him in New Zealand. He opened a restaurant south of uh, of Auckland, and uh, that was his dream. His life savings was in that, and it just wow. wasn't doing very well. Mm-hmm. And you know, he was like, "What are you doing?" And I said, "We don't know, but you know, you need a hand." And he said, "Yep." Yeah. And that was it. So we flew to New Zealand. We actually had a stopover at home in Copenhagen, and, and my girlfriend's from uh, back then was from uh, Gothenburg. So we had a break, mm-hmm. sort of family, and for four weeks, and then we, we went to New Zealand. And what was? Tell me about New Zealand because you know, you've gone from from you know well, huge you numbers. Can, you can imagine you can imagine sort of you know arriving into a, a like sort of a beach town in the middle of winter where you have like tumbleweeds you know <laughs> going down the street and you see a car one at one, one one car an hour maybe that that was really the, that was really the you know the, the reality of it and a restaurant that was that wanted to be something that. Uh, was out of place in that town. Yeah. Uh, so it was a sort of upper scale fine dining. You know, people would only go there on special occasions and so on. So, yeah, um, really fast had to change that around. And again, my chefing skills came in really handy there again. because the chefs were not really talented. So we were able to just do simple stuff and played it really nicely and change the menu around and, you know, get punters through. So. How did you explain to the owner, your friend at the time, that his business model was the wrong model? Oh, look, he, he was failing already prior to me joining. I said, look, if I'm going to join you, there's going to be one purpose for me joining. That's that we sell the restaurant. Yep. And he was like, but that's my life. Yeah. And I said, well, it's clearly not working. Yeah. So um, you we had spent, to make it work. Yeah. Spent six months on prepping for summer. And summer was when we wanted to sell it because it was it, that it, that town comes alive for mm-hmm. summer. So it was just an enormous amount of people. Yeah. And we ended up selling it. So it was it was, you know, Full circle, he ended up not losing any money. He didn't make any money, but he didn't lose any money. And, oh, and I was just really happy with that outcome. Uh, the last week of service uh, before handover, we, uh, I had a, uh, a guy come in for dinner with his family and he said, oh, you know, this is really nice. And, you know, I said, oh, yeah, we actually sort of, we're selling the restaurant and we're going to travel around. And he said, oh, here's my cart. You know, if you, if you want to, you know, talk to me at some stage, you can. I, I'm, I'm part of this hotel group. I said, okay. Always, that's good. It's always nice to have a you know a network of people yeah. you can contact. And so we traveled, and and then um, I took out his card one day, and I emailed him, and and he said, "Oh yeah, I'm based in Christchurch. I I, I head up this uh, uh, hotel group, New Zealand hotel group called Scenic Circle, mm-hmm. um, and you know, um, yeah, got in contact with him, and uh, he offered me a job." Uh, what did he two offer days. You? Yeah, he offered me a, an assistant a hotel manager's role and a food and beverage director role, so a combined yep. role in um, in French Joseph Glacier, which is on the west coast of the South Island. It's very, very remote. But uh, back then, you know, you could look up on the internet, but there was not really anything there. It was just an ice glacier. So it's like I said to my girlfriend, "That looks all right. Uh, that, that, that'll be okay." And then we looked up Lonely Planet, and then we're like, yeah, that, that's, you can go heli hiking and skiing and stuff. That's great. So it was like yep. from one extreme to the other, from really warm weather in Key mm-hmm. West and then to this. So, so yeah, we, we flew to Christchurch. Somebody came to pick us up, and we went to French Joseph, and we spent 18 months there. And now all of a sudden you're, you're, you're back in hotels. Then I was back in hotels, right. dealing with tours, dealing with, you know, uh, a very seasonal business where six, uh, six months out of the year we were full. Mm-hmm. And the rest of the time it was just empty because the mountain passes through from Christchurch and Queenstown would shut down. Yep. So you just couldn't get through. So all the whole team, all the team members in general, with, with the exception of the executive team, they're all casuals. And you just work the season and they go. So, so what, do you, what, what is a hotel like when, when, there's, when there's no one in it? I quiet. Mean, very yeah. quiet. Um, and yeah, we, did, we did maintenance. We did all random stuff, you know, like you'd have to fix rooms and, yeah. you know, with the GM and, yeah, you know look after the facilities and yeah, we did everything. Which is, you know, in hindsight, really something that taught me the most because you still have the grounds that need to be looked after. You still, you know, you have things, things like that that you gotta, yep. you gotta maintain and yeah. 
and then the season would start up again and you would just hire casually again and people would just come and there were a lot of you know uh, backpackers and so on and you go through the whole mode of, you know whole whole thing again where you have to rehire and so yeah. you're basically starting a new hotel every 12 months yeah. with with, yeah. with the, with the what what's that like? I mean, what going through and, and interviewing? Well, it's, I mean, it's fun. It was fun. Yeah. It was. It was. You know, it was very casual there. So it, like, it wasn't a five star environment or anything. Yeah. But people get there and go there and they, they you know, they, they they work for the five six months and they just earn a lot of money and they are in an environment where they can you know get to know a lot of people and yeah. then they leave. I mean, the facilities are quite large. You had a staff pub. You had you know you had staff quarters. You had all wow. these things. So pretty large. Yeah. So you're almost kind of starting to get this reputation of a Mr. Fix-It now. Yeah. Yeah? I, I, you, you, you know, I, I think, you know, it's all practical. You know, you gotta, you just yeah. got to be practical when you go and look at things. I don't know yeah. if I, I want to put that on my, on my resume. No? But, no, I, I like, I, yeah, I, I like a challenge and, and, and that's, that's, really, that's really how I operate. So I guess some people like consistency and like to go in and, and do a role and, and almost have some sort of structure around what they do every single day and, and be yeah. happy with that routine. But I guess that kind of routine is, isn't, I mean, you, you almost enjoy something well, that's different every day. Yeah, I think, I think throughout my career, uh, I, I've always been given projects. So I might be, I might, would have been in a role as a you know, hotel manager or a general manager or whatever, but there, there was always extra projects. So yeah. They will always come to me somehow and be that hotel openings or yep. you know, new challenges and you know, portfolios. So I guess what point did you kind of sit back and go, actually, you know what, I think I can do this. I want to be a, a GM. Well, I remember sitting at school and uh, we had a class, um, sociology or I think it was sociology class actually. And, and I remember the teacher, Brian Chapman, he said, oh, you now you have to write down on, on paper when you're going to be a hotel manager or general manager. And I remember I wrote down, I, I, was, uh, I, wanted, I was, wanted to be a GM when I was 37. I thought that was that's good time. Such you know, a random number. 15, 50, it was like 15, 16 years from when I started the industry, and that that would be good. Yep. That would be good. And so what, was, what was the reality? 20, 26. You were 26 when you when you, you your first ho- like GM type yeah. hotel management role. Yeah. That's uh, like f- I'm 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 thinking about what I was doing when I was 26, and I was definitely nowhere near being being a GM. So that's 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 a, that's an amazing in itself. Yeah, um, it's uh, it, it was. Yeah. I, guess, I guess everything happens for a reason, right? So, I when we left New Zealand, we came home and and I was introduced to TFE, uh, one way or another, and and actually via school again. It's all about your networking. It's like you know, I remember Rachel Argument, um, my then C- CEO. She um, she she had contacted school and said, "Oh, we're opening a hotel in Copenhagen. Do you have any Danish graduates?" And they're like, "Yeah, there's one guy." I was like, "Woohoo! That's me!" You know, <laughs> that's awesome. You know, so we had a conversation, and I, I actually worked uh, when we got my wife and our uh, girlfriend and uh, and I. We went back to Europe uh, after New Zealand, yep. and 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 I, I worked in in a F and B consultancy business, and and I really enjoyed what I was doing. But Rachel then reached out and said, "Oh, you know, can you go and check this out? We uh, we bought this uh, hotel development project, and uh, we just haven't seen any photos for the last many weeks." And I said, "Okay, yeah." Sure. So and it, it happened to be three or four kilometers from where we lived, and and I remember going down. It was just a hole in the ground with a sign on it. It just said Medina. Mm. It's like okay, well here's okay. your photo. Yep. You know, back to the internet kiosk, and you know, <laughs> send the email on Hotmail and go here you go. She goes, oh, it looks good. I said, yeah, it's a hole in the ground. It's a hole in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, then she asked me if I could meet with a, de- a development director that was in Europe and, and uh, Andrew. And I met with him and we, we, you know, met a couple of times and spoke about potentially what we could do with this space and mm-hmm. how we operated and, you know, housekeeping set setups and all these different things. And yeah, then, you know, I just helped them out with information. And I, I like it wasn't my intention to to think that I was going to be the general manager or anything of that project. It was just like, I'm happy to help you. Yeah, right. And I was really happy in my job. I, set up a, a, actually a, a, a restaurant in a hotel in Copenhagen that ended up getting one Michelin star. So I was really happy and wow. focused on that. And um, yeah, then out of the blue, Rachel said, I, we need to have an interview. And I said, oh, okay, we can have an interview. Yeah, and, of course. And we had an interview over the phone with a, with a, another person and, and they were like, well, we want hire to hire you as the GM, opening GM. And I was like, okay, okay, so I guess we'll, we'll do that. Why not? <laughs> 
So I, I finished up, I had four weeks notice uh, with the business and, mm -hmm. and I, I think I only did two weeks. They were like, your mind is already at this other project, just go, just it's go. fine. You know, I, I knew these people for a long time and they were yeah. like, you know, that's good for you, go, just go, you know, and concentrate. So I literally started in August 2005 and I went straight on a plane. The 1st of August, I went straight on a plane, I flew to Sydney. And I then spent three months in Sydney and Melbourne learning systems with with toga okay and yeah so let's 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 explore that now what was day one like of of, of because you know everyone dreams of, of being a gm what's what's day one like well i mean day one you mean with guests in a hotel or do you mean as the first so my first day was well, let's, essentially let's was, talk about both but let's talk about well it, first it was kind of funny because i arrived in sydney at crown street at our head office or at toga's old head office there yeah and they've completely forgotten the time difference so they have just set up meetings for me straight away. So I landed at like 7.55 in the morning and then I had meetings from nine o'clock and it was the whole day. Right. And I was just, in the end, I, like people, they were like, you look really tired. I'm like, well, I've just, you know, come off the flight. It, it was a 22 hour flight. And they're like, oh, okay, that's a bit rough, you know, like. And, and I did, let's yeah. go on with the meeting. Yeah, so I was just like, can everyone just leave their cards, their business cards, so I remember who you are. Because tomorrow I, I would have slept, and I wouldn't have a, have a clue, you know. But yeah, that was the start. It was full on. It was all, you know, strategy. It was all, you know, looking, you know, reviewing uh, systems and, you know, getting to to learn and, and know all the different aspects of, of how Toga was operating. So, so where was the property they were they were they were opening? In Copenhagen. Wow. Yeah. So they moved me from the so property which wasn't ready in Copenhagen. We moved. They moved me to Sydney and Melbourne for three months, and then I moved back um, and I did the opening, did the recruitment, and uh, yeah, did everything for it, and spent four and a half years there. What were you looking for in, when you were recruiting your, your, your managers? Um, look, I think it goes back to the emotional intelligence piece, really. Also, back then, you need to have the right attitude, but also heart. And you don't necessarily need to come from, in my mind, from, from a hospitality background. We hired a lot of, of different people there from different you know, uh, backgrounds. We hired some actors. We hired, yeah, we hired some really interesting people. You know, that would, you know, you, you know, I would say to them, well, why, why do you want to work for us? Oh look, I can I can turn up to work and I can be in different character every day. So <laughs> I, I get okay. the point. I mean, it's yep. like they're like they're yep. training. Yep, and they were doing really well. You know, they did really well for us. Because that's what hospitality is. It's almost that's a what performance it is. art, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, no, it you is. Know, you're putting it on is. a show for your guests yep. every day. It's a show every day. You got to live it. You got to yep. you know just live it. So. Okay, let's talk about night one. You've got guests coming into the hotel because you would have spent months and months and months preparing for this one so day. So night one was a snowstorm. Uh, we opened <laughs> the two first floors and uh, the, there was huge, huge uh, delays in the airport. Yep. And uh, you know, it ended up with us having to go and pick up the guests in the airport and uh, then we were somehow overbooked. So I had to bump. create bump. I had to create packages for guests that we would, we would book other hotels and put them into. But I, I, was, I drove out there myself. I picked them up in the airport and I said, I'm really sorry, but we don't have any rooms available for you. Wow. Uh, but I booked her into the Radisson or whatever I booked them into and you know everything is paid for and you know I, we, we want to look after you and here's a voucher please come back and you know family you know families were like obviously inconvenient from that perspective so we you know we looked after them greatly we gave them Tivoli passes a great oh, okay. amusement park in Copenhagen yeah. like we did yeah. all the things we could and you know um, out of the, the the people that we bumped and the guests we bumped we we got them all back a week later, later, or if they were returning to Europe the following year, that's cool. They would come back and stay with us. That's so, cool. Yeah. So four and a half years you, you you spent at this property. What was what was if you're going to hang your hat on one or maybe two things that you that that you really achieved there? What what were they? I think the biggest thing was to get Danish people to understand what an apartment hotel was versus a normal hotel, because. There was only really one of those types in Copenhagen, a very small apartment hotel. And the, yep. the, the guests, like the, our guests, they just didn't understand. They would call up and say, I need to book a room. I said, would you like a one bedroom apartment? A one? Why do I need a one bedroom apartment? Yep. Like, no, that's what we have. Why? I, that's why I just want a room. I said, well, you got a living room, you got, you know, and it's the same price. Oh, okay, I'll take that. And like, <laughs> it's all about educating, right? And it took yeah. a while. So we went on all the, you know, ITB, went on all the trade shows and fairs and stuff in, in Europe uh, for a long time and really educated. And then, you know, with the openings that, that then followed in, in Germany, in Berlin, we just started getting the brand out. And it was really a piece of, you know, educating. It was what it was about. 
So why did Toga go down that that road of of, of apartments when you know the market really well, didn't to- really know about it? Like Toga, it? Toga. I think I mean Toga's model was that Medina was always the that was always the, the apartment hotel. Yep. So they thought that was that would be the right entry point into mm-hmm. into Europe. Yep. Um, and was it? Yeah, look, it's very successful. It was very successful, but it took longer time than than I think everyone anyone had foreseen to actually get people educated to to understand what the what the brand was about. Yeah. So, um, but still, big challenge. And and I always thought, you know, if we can build a team that can create a really really unique sort of guest experience, um, then you know people will start talking about it and really sort of embrace that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the hotel was number one on TripAdvisor for, for three and a half years. Wow. Um, in Copenhagen, it, you know, we won all these awards from Expedia and, and, and all these different things. So we knew we were doing things right. But it was, you know, as soon as you had a guest through the door, then you, you would know that there'll be, a, there'll be a fan of the brand. Yep. And then it, it started, you know, oh, do you have others? And we're like, yeah, we're actually building one in Berlin. And then, you know, we opened the one in Berlin and they were like, oh, this is great. We can go from, you know, city to city and stay on. And we had one in Budapest as well. And so in, in Hungary, so yes, yeah, so that was rebranded. And yeah, just, you know, it, it went from one to five. So I, I left, we had five five hotels in, in, in Europe. And um, yeah. And you were, man, you were managing them? Well, or no, you were just no, managing no, look, the there was property. managers in the, in the hotels. I, I, helped, I helped, uh, helped a lot, but you know, uh, the setups uh, with, you know, the planning, mm-hmm. um, design in some instances, uh, for Frankfurt in particular. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, look, uh, there was no area manager. So, I mean, I, I guess I'd been there the longest, so that would, it was natural for, for us to, you know, speak together and talk together as, as GMs and you know if somebody had an idea we would share it etc yep. but yeah it wasn't really until I left that there was a uh, maybe six months prior there was a director of operations hired that you know came from came from uh, Australia and so. it kind of just brought brought that whole group together. yeah so then that person went to went to spend time in in Berlin because Germany was then the hub Germany now has a n- number of hotels yep. um, and and she then spent time there so yeah okay um, I guess as a, again as a GM, you know what 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 kind of feelings did you have that that first night when you when when you opened it up? I mean, how do you prepare yourself for for, for guests? Because I mean, you spend months yeah. preparing um, for it. I uh, I I when when it, in situations like that, what happens is I I, I will always forget to eat. I was never I would never ate anything. So my girlfriend's like, okay, I'm just gonna feed you. You just gotta have some food. You just gotta deal with this. So you get some energy and so on. So yep. but look. We opened and yeah, it was a late night. You know, I, I think I left the hotel at midnight or something. But just the mm-hmm. the feeling of of you know having achieved the opening and and the guests were actually there and they were in, you know they, were ha- they had a good time was yep. just it was a good feeling. You of course drained. You spend all this time on it, but mm. you know it's it's yeah it, it's a good feeling. You're never going to get a hundred percent right, are you? When when no. you when you're and opening. and if if you think you are, then you're in for a rude awakening. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're a six star, or five star, or whatever you are, one star. There's always going to be things that's going to break yep it's gonna have water turn up in places it shouldn't turn up or you know things falling off the walls that yep. shouldn't fall off the walls but that's you know that's hotel management for you so I mean a lot of these a lot of these guys are probably almost dreaming about you know opening a, a ho- or doing a pre-opening of a hotel what's the best thing about it and what's the worst thing about it well the best thing is uh, the excitement when you see the guests come through the doors and you're there to welcome them and you know uh, we always had a you know we had a thing where we'd always take photos with the guests and we'd say, oh, we'll send that to Australia. And they're like, to Australia? Why? Well, we're an Australian brand. And, you know, yep. and we did that in Berlin too. I was there for those openings too. And, and I really loved that. It was just that sort of interaction. And really, you know, then after maybe 25 minutes, you would call the room and say, is there anything I can do for you? And they're like, why are you calling me? Wow. It's like, because we're here, we want to ensure you're all right if you need anything. And they're like, "This is great. We never have, we're not used to that service." And I said, "Well, that's what we do." Yep. You know, so so that that's probably the best thing. I think uh, the worst thing with the opening, and I've done quite a few now. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot of there can be a lot of you know pressure put put upon timelines and things like that where you know your owners they they want to open the doors, you know, yeah, and and you they, they they don't like delays. So that can be quite hard. Also, the timing on team members. You know, you you, you want to hire an executive team that's ready to go, and if you hire them too too soon, then they're they're not going to be empowered to make any decisions because this is nothing to do. You yeah. know, so um, that's that's probably one of the things I, I think. If if any of you guys are going to do an opening uh, or pre-opening, etc., you project you you know you got to take that into consideration. And I mean, 
in a pre-opening, there's no hours of trade. Like it's you're just on. Just bear that in mind. Yep. It's it never ends. There's no 7.6 hour no, shift. No, no, that's not. You know, <laughs> you manage your own breaks. That's what you manage, and yep. then the rest just you just gotta get on with it. And the award just goes out the window. Yes, yeah. yes, I'll yeah, yeah. say that. I mean, that's just <laughs> how it is. I mean, look, if you have a good manager or good leader in your business, then that, that person will also empower you to take the time off a week later. You know, that's yeah. not what it, it's not. A, it's not about using and abusing. It's about managing people and, and at the end of the day. So, yeah. What, what came after that? So you got four and a half years. So, um, yeah, in the meantime, uh, my then wife and I uh, got our permanent residency and we we're like, all right. We're gonna come back to Australia. Yep. And so the the job originally in Copenhagen was just a two year contract. That mm -hmm. was what I agreed to with the CEO. Yep. And it just went too fast, and we had too much fun, so it ended up being four and a half years. So, wow. um, yeah, I, I just basically we agreed to it, finished the financial year, and then go 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 come back to Sydney. And so I just had an internal transfer, and I I ended up uh, working at the Adina Central at okay. Central Station. Yeah. Yep. So. What was that like compared to, to being in Europe? Oh, obviously, it's a little bit warmer here. Oh, it's nice. It was nice to be back yeah. home, as I called it. It was, you know, it's lovely. Yep. And um, lucky for me, I continued a, a sort of close working relationship with the owners uh, of, of TFE or Toga back mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. um, and they owned, uh, they owned their Dina at Central, and, and we had to go through a, a refurbishment. So I got that as my first project, really. So, so you've um, gone from a pre opening <laughs> to now. A co complete opposite. So you're now going to yeah. refurb. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. My gosh. So that and was what, a lot of fun. And and what was that like? Kind of working with owners to try and get them to spend money and being able to justify their return on investment. Oh, look. I mean, there was a budget already, at, you know, set in place before I arrived. I just took over the project and just, you know, had the had the you know builders and 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 you know the, the trades work a little faster than what they, they were meant to. I guess mm. all from a planning perspective. And you know, we finished a little bit early and. Yeah, look, you that's know, unusual. It right? is, but it, I mean, I guess they, they sort of got worried when this tall Danish guy walked through the door and started <laughs> saying stuff to them and barking at them at times. So why, why are you sitting down and relaxing? We meant to finish this refurb, and you yep. know. Yep. So yeah, we. It, we but it was a good. It was a good process. I learned a lot along the way too. Um, you know, um, I, I think the the team that that I sort of took over um, also uh, were you know embracing some new. Uh, leadership, mm -hmm. and and so so that was something that I worked on at the same time. So that it was it was a really good process actually, process actually. Yeah. How important is project management in to, to a hospitality manager or a hotel manager? Well, look, I, I think you need to be able to manage your time. You need to be able to manage you know projects on the side, yep. uh, you know, on on top of what you do normally. There's no doubt. Um, so it's important. It's important that you 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 know uh, where you need to be and, and and you know all the timelines. So I think project management is is a big part of, of of you know hotel management in general. And I guess what's what's the biggest change when you go from you know being an, an operational leader to now being you know a hotel executive? You know, in terms of skill set, what what. What what do you have to flex up when you when you when you're in that executive space? Well, I space? think I mean the strategy piece is is vital. Like right. The strategy it, you just you, you need to think differently. Um, I think as a GM or hotel manager or any senior leader in a hotel, um, you're on the ground. You're putting out fires. You're dealing with guest issues. You're dealing with all these things. And and when you get to a, a I guess a higher level or an executive level, C suite, suite level, call it whatever you like, um, you, you got to strategize differently. You got to work out well how many. Uh, you know, amazing team members do you have in the different hotels that you can rely on if something happens? Or how are you gonna put the, the people uh, together if you have a different opening or you have a new project yeah. so you know that the guest service will never suffer? So you start to strategize in a different way. Um, when you're in the business yourself, everyone knows this, oh, if they don't do it right, this is a classic sort of mentality, if they don't do it right, I'll just do it myself. Yeah. It's fine, everyone, I'll just do everything myself. And you just, there comes a time when you gotta stop you thinking like that. that, you can't do it. So, yeah, that piece, that strategy piece changes. So, so it almost gets to the point where you, you're no longer following instruction or not following instructions, but I guess someone's not telling you what to do anymore. You're almost kind of telling yourself and the rest of the organization what needs to be done to, to that's achieve it. That's to achieve it. Achieve that's it. That's actually really true. Um, yeah. I have a very close relationship with my owners, and, and I mean, I, I feel... Um, I feel more like a, a mediator between the two of them yep. uh, than you know them 
telling me what to do. They've said to me, you run the hotels, you run the group, um, we like the returns, great. Yep. Um, and um, you know, we take it from there. And they obviously have different targets and different mm -hmm. goals and strategy, to, strategy towards where mm -hmm. they want to see our hotels. But then that, that comes into our, our, I guess, negotiations or, or, or conversations in regards to where we get to. Because now you're in a space where you're actually playing with other people's money. Yes, and yet you're, it's if, great. It's great. Of course it is. Yeah. But I mean, you've, you've, as, as, a, as a manager, you've, you've got, you're responsible for giving them a return. That's, that's essentially sure. what you're, you're doing as, yeah. a, as, as a manager. Look, I, and a lot I of think, I think it's really that. important that, look, anyone in the industry, doesn't matter what role you're in, you should really think of anything you do as, as if it was your business. Hmm. So if you're a receptionist or you are you know, a, a line manager or you're a food and beverage manager or whatever you are, if you think of the business as yours, then I can, you know, you can only assume that you have really high expectations and you do what you should do, you know. So um, I don't see a big difference. Um, yes, I know that the zeros at the end of the check that sign if you purchase a hotel <laughs> is a lot different than if you go and buy a gin and tonic, but it, it, well, not in Sydney. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. They're very expensive, <laughs> but it, it's really, um, it's really just a, you know, I guess a, a perception of of how how, uh, how you manage and how you lead. Uh, yeah. My 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 point of view is that there shouldn't be a difference. You yeah. should treat your team members and your your tribe, as we call it, uh, at the value. Uh, we should we should treat them with the utmost respect. Either way, it doesn't matter what they do. And in my mind, if I look at the teams and, and tribe members that we have, the guys on the ground, the guys that are standing in the hotels that has the first you know, uh, connection with the guests, they are vital for the business. If they don't do right. what they're meant to do and they don't create this great, unique connection, then we're just like everyone else. So let's, let's, let's talk about Verio because mm -hmm. I think it's, 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 an, it's an amazing product and um, I guess before we get to the product, what drove you to kind of jump from from TFE? I mean, you were kicking some amazing goals with with TFE, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and you were in an extremely senior position with with the group. And all of a sudden, you're now kind of going, "Hang on a minute, I'm going to, you know, go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum and go to a startup." Yeah. I mean, what, what was going through your head? I turned forty. No, no. <laughs> um, I um, look. Um, I spent 12 and a half years with, with what I, I believe still in my heart is Australia's best hotel group, TFE yeah. Hotels. I, yeah. I've grown up in the business. I think we had 20 odd hotels when I started and when I finished last year, they had 80, 82, 83 hotels. Wow. I mean, it's a massive growth, right? Wow. And, um, I, I was, you know, I, I, I always said to myself, look, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to grow, but it has to be for the right reasons. And, and, and I, I kept on growing in, in portfolio sizes, in challenges. I, I was lucky enough to open the Adina down at Bondi, a yep. massive, you know, undertaking, um, and 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 then still look after a portfolio in New Zealand. And and, and the last two two years and a bit, I, I sat on the on the inner city portfolio, which is you know would range from twelve to fourteen hotels with massive turnover, big yep. turnover, you know. Yep. Um, and 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 look, I just thought to myself, I, I think I think maybe I I want to I want to see if I can go to another uh, another level in a different uh, sort of environment mm -hmm. um, and uh, challenge myself that way. And I think uh, the, the, the thing with, uh, with bigger organizations is that when they get to a level, it gets really hard to change things. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and my main motiv motivation for, for always to go, go to work was always, oh, I can make a change here. I, I, I can do things. I can, I can make things easier for my, for my team yep. members. Yep. And, and that's the, the main reason why I, I, I said, all right, I'm, I'm gonna give it a go with a startup as in very, I, I feel that we can make a massive difference to our guests. So who made the pitch? Did you approach them or did they, did they come and find you? No, they found me. They found it was you. A, I say this to Reese, who's, my, who's my, one of the founders. It was, a, it was actually a three year long bromance. Um, <laughs> It was, a, yeah, it was a long, uh, long conversation about, you know, hotel operations in general and, and, yep. and you know, management in general and, and, and so on that led to, to, to me, you know, deciding that I wanted to really give it a go. Um, I'm hearing a theme and this theme is, is networking and it's really getting out there yeah. and talking to people and yeah. building who you know. Sure. Because that's, I, I've noticed that now with, with, with a lot of your, 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 your positions and your movements, it's all yeah. based on 
on on who you knew and, and I think I think networking is is it's free. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't cost much. You, you know, if you don't if you don't have a business card, I suggest you go and get one printed and put your name on it. It can yeah. say student and it can say I'm, um, you know, top notch and whatever it want you want to put on it. But put an email on it and just have it. When you go and meet people, give them a card. Say to them, I'm studying, but wow, I, I find you know whatever you said or whatever you heard really interesting, and I would like to stay in contact with you. It's free. You know, it doesn't cost anything, and I. I I think networking is, is alpha omega in anything we do. It's all about who you can relate to. And, and you know, you may not disagree with something that is said or whatever, but still, um, if you feel you can sort of feel an alignment with someone, well then give them a card. Or, I think it's great. You know? yeah. I, I really do. And I think it's, it's, it's a huge take out for, for all of our students to, to kind of understand mm. exactly the power of that network. Um, lifestyle hotels in, in Australia. Yeah, I mean they they're just they're growing exponentially. I mean you've got TFE, you've got you guys. I mean QT are, are, are kicking some serious goals. Yeah, Overlows and another yeah. you know little little play there. I mean for for a lot of our students, lifestyle hotels are just you know un unknown. What is a lifestyle hotel to you? Okay, so to me, I think it's about creating a brand really where you um, you're able to offer something that's going to entice your clientele to actually feel part of it. So. You know, mm. if you join, if you come and stay with us, you know we, we we like local partnerships. So we're not cookie cutter, and we will never be. So we'll rather pay some more money to get a top quality brand and and a you know a, a co-branding opportunity uh, with something we can give our guests um, that will make a difference to the guest stay. Yep. So when you arrive with us, you get a welcome drink. You know, you have the fastest internet in the in the entire well, all of all of Australia. We and we we know that's for sure because we don't want to go down the avenue of having the classic issues that you have in hotels where yep. you have to pay for internet and it's really slow. Yep. Or then you pay a little bit more and then it's still really still slow. Still really slow. <laughs> so we uh, we don't go down that avenue. So we have really fast internet um, and that's included in your rate. Uh, we uh, we give you if you if you you know arrive after four o'clock we give you a, a bespoke uh, uh, offer of uh, four different gin and tonics when you arrive. Uh, we have uh, co uh, worked with a, a distillery out in, in the Blue Mountains where we have we've created our own Vario gin. Wow. The, uh, the the whole scenario through this and this is you know I guess my little sort of. Um, Christmas present to the owners was that we we went out to to Richmond. Uh, we sat down. We created a gin together. We did all the botanicals together. Uh, we did a distillery, and then we created a brand um, and a uh, I guess um, identity around it, where we would have four different gin and tonics. They'll be named after the founders' two kids each. So you get a curated oh. card um, around the gin and tonic you pick, and it would just. You know, if it's Stella, it's a squeaky Stella, and it you know it has a story around S Stella, and it has a hibiscus flower in it, and it's just like it's just different, and it's included in your rate. Wow. You get to your room, you get uh, you know free Netflix. It's included in your rate. You come down in the morning, we give you a barista coffee. It's included in your rate. You get a nice pastry. It's included in your rate. When you want to go and explore, you get on your bike. Your vary your bikes. It's included in your rate. Um, if you go to Broadway, we have handheld devices in the rooms uh, that works as the uh, phone, uh, but it gives you free international phone calls, free internet, Google Maps, and anything you like on it. So you just need to lock on it, and it's yours for your stay. So there are some of the things that entice people to feel part of the yeah, brand. Right. You know, um, we we don't do big contracts with you know big uh, food companies mm -hmm. uh, to get let's say a coffee contract. We mm -hmm. always work with the local. Yep. Little guy around the corner who has a little roastery, or you know, like that, who likes to you know sell you a couple of bags of coffee. That's how we work, you know. Yeah, right. So it's it becomes very bespoke. It becomes mm -hmm. very nimble. Yep. And uh, quite exciting, actually. And I guess so. that model allows you to to be able to change. So if if, if you know trends Absolutely. change, you, yep. you don't have to keep going up the the, the food chain to say and have to meet. With certain brand standards, you can just pretty much do what you need. You to know, do. I, I always used to say that you know, as you know, the bigger the hotel chain gets, the the, the more SOPs are put in place. Yeah. And um, you know, in a startup, you just don't have the SOPs. You just, they don't exist. You 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 write them as you go. Yep. And if you you have a project that fails, well, then you just get up and try again. Yep. And you take note of what you tested, and you you just make sure nobody in the organization does it again. But then you just move on to the next. And that's that's the difference. 
Someone explained to me once that a, a lifestyle brand is, is almost there to try and replicate the guest's home experience, mm. but away, away from home. Yeah, look. It's becoming we, more and more. It's true. You know, you, you, want, you want people to feel an alignment with, with, with you when, you walk, when they walk through your doors. Mm. But I, I think, you know, lifestyle is many things. You know, it, you, know you, can, you can, you know, sell products and so on that you're proud of and so on, and that's fine. There needs to be an alignment from that branding perspective. Yep. Yep. But I think it's about thinking outside the, the square and just offer something that's not in the market. It's offering something that um, the guest, if they go to uh, you know uh, Hilton, and all with all due respect to Hilton, because I work for them and all, mm-hmm. <laughs> all that, but like you just don't get the same. Yep. You don't get the same heart. And it's for us, it's about creating a connection between uh, our hosts or our tribe members on the ground with the guests, so the guests really feel that they want to come back. So let's talk about very you now. Mm-hmm. You you're the chief operating officer at yep. the, what. What does the COO do? What's he spends he spends a lot of time on on deals. <laughs> he spends a lot of time on or oh, she at least me. I, I I spend a lot of time on strategy. Yeah. Um, and I don't only sit uh, with the I guess the responsibility for Vary. I also look after. There's five other businesses within within that organization. So. Mm-hmm. We, uh, we have a, a student uh, long-term lease business as well we look after. Yep. Uh, we have a co-working facility that we've just launched in George Street, at George Street. Yep. Uh, we have, so that, that's a brand in, on its own. And then we have a co-living brand as well, which we're launching in six weeks. So, What's a uh, co-living brand? So co-living is more long stay. It's more based on a, a model around membership, uh, but it's very sort of selective. Um, we're opening up out in uh, Annandale. Uh, 35 uh, studio uh, apartments there that are are based around uh, sort of a ergonomic uh, setup um, and very sort of sustainable. Uh, We we, want to try and get the highest ratings we can from a sustainability perspective. So we have, you know, Neighbors 5 Star Rating. We have, you know, uh, water tanks on the roof. And we have all these different things, right? Uh, But it's based around uh, someone spending minimum a month with us. Um, they then have the freedom to co-work in the spaces that are public. They also have the freedom to, you know, utilize the yoga studio, uh, utilize whatever uh, wow. facilities that are there. And um, my sort of little, I guess, uh, project there was to, uh, I really thought it would be important that we could entertain. And when I say we, are, I think as a guest. So we build this really cool chef's kitchen yep. where the guests can go and cook and they can invite their friends over and they can host. Oh, you know, wow. They can actually have their friends over and 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 you know um, have a good time while they're there, um, and it just makes people feel a little bit more like home and and so on. So so it's it's yeah it's quite different. So how far away is that now from? We're from about six seven weeks off opening. Um, before I came here today, we we're signing off on the yep. designs and and so on. So yeah, so yeah, it, it's it's you know the building is up, so we're just doing wow. interiors. So I mean, we, we caught up a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about some of the the, the acquisitions that you guys had on the uh, on the um, on the horizon, and some of the the challenges you guys yeah. have, have had, um, particularly around some of your some of your hotel products. Do you want to do you want to talk to us about yeah. about buying a, an existing hotel <laughs> yes. um, and and some of the baggage, pun intended, that comes with with sure. that. I mean, there's a lot of challenges in anything you do, and I mean, if as a startup, we we, we I think we've been sort of. Nobody's really paid attention to us in the market. Yeah. Um, my owners and the founders have they got a lot of a lot of real estate around Sydney. They built it up around their university long lease business over yep. the years. Yep. Um, and you know, got into hotels sort of accidentally, and you know, here we are. We have we have five hotels in Sydney. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, we about six seven weeks six weeks ago we announced uh, an acquisition. We purchased Pond Hill Apartments in Melbourne, which was fourteen hotels. We took over overnight. Um, so you went from five to all of a sudden now 19. 19, yeah. Yep. So um, with that obviously comes a huge responsibility in regards to team members, uh, in regards to restructuring, in regards to doing all these different things. And, and there's also some massive challenges. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a whole mindset of team, uh, team members uh, from an existing business that's been working for more than 30 years. Mm-hmm. They think in one way we come in, you know, how do we, uh, you know, minimize, uh, you know, risk how, how do we actually look at uh, taking over a business that's run okay, but we think can be optimized dramatically? Yep. yep. Um, and so that's the process. So there's a lot of challenges there. There can be a lot of disgruntled yeah. team members, or there can be a lot of you know 
buildings that are requiring a lot of capex, uh, you know, attached to it, capital expenditure work, and, yep. and, and, and look, it's a challenge for sure. How do you socialize that message where, I mean, the, the brand is, is kind of established, yep. it's, it's well known, but how do you socialize to the teams? Like, you're doing well, but we're gonna make it better. Because I mean, some of them are thinking, well, you know what, it's, it's not broken. Why do you need to fix it? Why don't you just keep going? Well, look, I, I think um, the main message here is that you, you gotta, you know, we, we took everyone over uh, on paper uh, yep. and, and uh, on contract and no issues with that. You know, we yep. just made sure that they understood that they were on, at the same terms and, and so on. And then little by little, you introduce certain changes. Yep. Um, I mean, we could do, uh, we could have gone in and just change everything straight away, but that's not how we work. Mm-hmm. Um, we we know there's a lot of IP in the and you know I am in in the actual business, so we want to actually get to know the custodians of the business. You yep. want to know someone who's been there for 25 years and how it's worked. Yep. You know you want to know why somebody has spent 10 years as a GM in a row and you know where they see the challenges. So it's about finding mm-hmm. out who they are and 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 work with them, and then you you work towards your other strategy, which in in our case has been to. Uh, roll out the Varia model in in Melbourne, mm-hmm. and and go away from you know a, an example could be a, a you know a resident manager. So it's a couple, for example, that would work in a hotel where we would rather have a, a, a hotel manager uh, live off site but run the business as yep. their own. So that's another it's an example. So it's a long term play. It's not something. I mean, they give you the keys overnight and it's yours overnight, yeah. but it's yeah. not technically yours. And, and until you you need to you need to obviously work on with what you have to mm-hmm. get from A to B, yeah, right. Uh, but strategy is, is everything. You know, yep. you gotta work out who wants to get on the journey with you and who's not yep. interested and yep. you deal with that. And they're, they're the tough conversations. I that think they're the tough conversations to and you, you, you just gotta prepare yourself. It's hard mentally to prepare anyone to go into a, a meeting where potentially you would talk r- redundancy, um, retrenchment, retrenchment and so on. So that's not ever nice, but it, it, you know, it, it comes with the role and it comes with that level of seniority where you just got to yeah. go in and ensure that the person in front of you, although you're delivering something that is not nice for them, mm-hmm. you, they actually feel comfortable throughout the process. Yeah. And I think a lot of companies don't think that way. We actually go above and beyond to actually yeah. ensure that that process is good for the team member or the, you know, the person that, that may be laid off. So it's, it's, it's important. Yeah. And um, I, I guess how's how's the very journey going now, and and what's what's coming, what's on the horizon for you guys? So we have uh, so with Barry and Pond Hill, we obviously have taken the fourteen hotels over, um, and you know we are working out where we want to put our brand, um, be that one of the existing buildings or some other projects we have mm-hmm. going. Um, we will have a Vario in 2018, uh, maybe it will be first quarter of 19, but we'll have definitely have a branded hotel in Melbourne. Yep. Um, Vario in general obviously has had, uh, I'll say since uh, late last year, a lot of uh, you know, attention in the media and so on. And, and, and because of that, obviously, we, we get a lot of sort of opportunities. Mm-hmm. So um, we, are, we currently have three projects that are being built. Uh, we have a uh, joint venture out at Green Square, uh, which is a 144-room um, hotel, uh, which is going to have uh, also co-living, co-working. Yep. Um, it's going to have full food and beverage facilities, etc. cetera, um, and some quirky stuff I can't tell you about yet, but uh, some really cool stuff. Um, um, then we have a project in uh, Elizabeth Bay, which is a conversion of an apartment block, which mm-hmm. we're, we're doing currently. Um, and we're going to put a very, very cool restaurant into that, operated by a very, very cool chef cool. Um, who is quite well known. Still can't tell us that? I can't tell you that, no. Um, and then uh. we have a project in uh, Surrey Hills, which is a conversion of an old Spanish mansion, actually. Wow. Which we're going to make into a very, so it's going to be very exclusive. We're going to put a sort of a glass roof over an internal courtyard. We have trees and going to build a cafe restaurant there and it, it'll be... Pretty cool. It's yeah. sounding very Scarface. Very Scarface. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, not no, 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 okay, not Scarface. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I guess, what kind of work are you guys doing around around branding? How do you how do you get the market to know who you are? Well, we, again, we've been very nimble and bespoke about it. We have an amazing brand director who's basically, I always say, he's got three real children and then he has very you. <laughs> and so it can get a bit touchy at times with him. Uh, he, yep. You know, if he, he, he does stuff and, you know, creates stuff and, 
and you know if operations doesn't like it he takes it to heart but yep. um, no he's, he's very creative so um, we are we at the moment and we've actually just uh, finished our recruitment we, we just hired a digital marketing uh, director yep. who's come on board who is going to work on all our brands in one go and so it's um, yeah it's, it's 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 game on now for us we, we need to really future proof ourselves so We've just hired two area managers, one for Melbourne, one for Sydney. We've hired a, a digital marketing director, as I said. So, I mean, we're looking closely into a CRM now, which we need to, to, to bring, bring into the business. Yep. Um, and it's something that uh, many bigger groups, um, they in hindsight look at, and then it gets tough for them to roll out. So we had a sort of a, a, a infancy stage now where we can do it, we can spend the money, we can roll it out, and mm. the guests will feel an instant uh, gratification, I guess we, we can say, so yeah. So we've got a room full of, full of you know, Blue Mountain students now and, and on yeah. the, on, yeah. online, I guess. Mm. What are you looking for in a, in, in a very you employee? I want to call it Vario Pont Hill because you know there's, cool. there's, there's two sides. Uh, side, and side they're, called, the story. they're called tribe members. They're not we call them tribe yeah. members. Cool. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Look, um, I, I, I want to say that you know if you want to join us in, in, in any any way, um, you need to love the area that you live in and work in. So it's important to us that you really embrace Sydney mm -hmm. um, if you want to live in and work in Sydney. Um, and that uh, you, uh, if you were to come and work for us, can give us something different than somebody else. So I would expect someone to come and interview with us who would have a solid knowledge about all the cool places where they live, because that's what you want to share with our guests. Yep. Um, it's not about you know, the brand Bible you get out of a, you know, this is what you have to say, this is how you act, and these are the things you need to recommend, because we had a commission. <laughs> that's not how we work, quite the contrary, we don't need that. We, we want you just to take the ownership and really just you get the empowerment at the same time to, you know, be yourself and really um, recommend what you like. And if you have that attitude and you have that uh, way of thinking, mm -hmm. well, then you'll be a success with us for sure. Okay. My last question before I open it up to the audience, I guess, it, it, it's such a, a fast moving industry, you know, hotels. It's, mm. it, it, it's really, I mean, if you think about where it was 10 years ago and where it is now, it, it's, yeah. you, it's nothing alike. I guess as, as a manager, as a, as a COO, how do you keep up to date with all of the innovations that are, that are, that are happening in the industry? And then how do you kind of decide which, which one you, you want to kind of say, yes, let's pick that up. And which one is like, mm, maybe not for us. Well, I think, um for us, being a startup, we know, we, we, we start with nothing and we try and create and we, we actually have like a think tank within our head office where we meet and we have all these random people that turn up and they have all these ideas and yep. we go, oh, that's rubbish, that's not gonna work. Yeah, right. Or we go, oh, that's a good idea, let's discuss it. Yep. So, so that's really what it's about. You're just gonna, you gotta have to remember that um, from our perspective, we wanna be here in 40 years. We don't, wanna, we don't wanna build this business up and just be sold. That's not, that's not our intention. Yep. It's not what we, we, we need to do or we want to do. So we wanna create something unique and, and with that comes technology. You know, everyone is on their phone. Everyone is, you know, mm. millennials are, you know, they're ruling the world on their phones. They know everything that they, you know, need to do and want to do is on their phone, you know, so. I can see some that are on yeah. their phones at yeah, the I moment. Mean, at, the, at the end of the day, it's about, you know, it's about being part of that technology drive and, and, and feeling that we can push the envelope in many of those areas yep. and, and be up front. I mean, uh, the hotel we have down at Broadway that has these devices, is, they were the f we were the first one in Australia to have them because we just thought it was cool. I mean, how nice is it to give a guest from overseas a phone that's preloaded where they can call Singapore or Hong Kong or London or whatever, free of charge and free internet. They don't have to go and get a SIM card. Wow. We, we wanna do that. We wanna give people that experience. And it goes back again to our co-working facility, which we're about to open. We have, we're gonna have 450 people in this one building, right? We've uh, built a restaurant in the, in, in the bottom of, of the building and we've built an app now where if you, you become a, if you're a hot desk or whatever, you have a lease there, in the morning on your app, you, uh, you said, it will say, hey, um, hey Anthony, uh, good to see you, good morning. If you put in your order before 10 o'clock, we'll deliver by your desk, right? Oh, wow. So you have that connectivity and, and, and you know, constant communication with, with, with the guests. Mm -hmm. But at the same time too, we're putting these devices, phone devices into our leased areas. So, um, they'll have that as a, as, as a phone. 
So that's just part of their lease. So they, you know, we try to imagine be a startup with all your costs. You got to call Hong Kong. You got to call America. You got to call these places, and it's just yeah. part of your lease. It's just there. Use it. You can do it whatever you want. So we try and be different in that way. I, I get the feeling that there's a huge sense of community in everything you do. I guess that's where the tribe yeah. bit yeah. comes from, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 No, that's that's really really cool. Um, I'm going to open it up to the audience, and then hopefully by by at some stage, Lura are going to have any questions, but the, the floor is yours, Town Hall. Um, any questions for for Casper? Uh, what are some characteristics of a leader that you think you have that has helped you become um, who you are, take on any roles? It's a great question. Um, I think uh, you know a, a strong character. You know, characteristic personally for me, I think. I, I'm, I'm, look, I want to be challenged in what I do. And, and I, I, I always said this to myself, I don't want to be a, in a job where I feel I'm in a job, right? So I don't want to wake up in the morning and dread going to work, right? So that's something for me that is really, really important. So I also feel that if I can go to work on a daily basis and make a difference around the people that works in my, in my environment, then I'm winning. So that's one of the really sort of found foundational things that I have with myself. I, I feel that it's important that the team around me feel uh, empowered, but also they feel that they can be creative. And I think being in a startup, mm. we're all creative. We're very, very creative. And um, it's important. It's really important. And anyone who, 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 who's coming through the industry now, um, you all have times where you are in, in a positions where you potentially don't feel that you are there for the right reason or whatever. But like you really have to determine with yourself, okay, am I going to chase uh, you know a a, a career uh, with a business that has a great you know name, uh, where I'm not feeling that I'm part of anything, mm. or am I going to mm. go somewhere where I feel appreciated for what I do, and I have a good time? And when it comes back to it, you think about this: sixty-five to seventy percent of your time in your life is spent at work. Yeah. Now my philosophy is we might as well have some fun while we're there because. <laughs> If you don't, absolutely, it's just not worth it. So that's really, yeah. Great answer. Me? Question at the back. Um, with, with Drew being such a, like a new, it's a startup, yeah? Yeah. So like, obviously, it's, 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 for you guys, it's a, it's a huge asset to hire people that have that creative sense of mind, right? Yeah. So my question is, as you grow, you know, as, very, as a new brand grow, how do you continuously provide that innovation, that creativity? Because I feel like when brands become at a, least, a, a certain size, they, they lose that feeling of innovation and creativity. Mm. They start focusing on all the financials and, and the yeah. so <laughs> how are you? How are you planning to, to keep that up? Okay, so that's a really good question and, and yeah. something that I've, I've you know, asked a uh, number of times, uh, same question to my owners actually, uh, founders, and, and the main thing for us is this, um, we're not just going to roll Vario out to all the hotels we've acquired. Uh, we have four Varios now, and there's still a long way to go for us to, to really get through our customer journey, how guest-centric we want the brand to get to, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, if we have a fifth Vario within this year, then we're happy with that. But for me, it's really about hiring the right people to go through on that journey with me so we can deliver. And it, it, it is, at the end of the day, it all comes down to people. It doesn't matter what technology you have, it doesn't matter how much money you have, if you don't have the right people, mm. then you're not gonna succeed. So yes, uh, to answer your question in regards to hiring, et cetera, recruitment, it, is, it, is, it takes a long time for us, and way longer than what I'm used to in my previous roles, yeah. to hire someone, because it's gotta, be, it's gotta be the right fit. I always say they gotta be a little bit crazy to join me, which is fine. Like, but if they get that and they understand the humor that's part of it, yep. then they'll, they'll fit in. They'll really fit in. I guess it's about being authentic to who you are as, as an organization and really yeah. saying, this is who we're gonna be. Mm. We're, gonna, we're gonna stick by this. We're yeah. not gonna, we don't wanna grow and become this, this cookie cutter hotel just like every other hotel. We, yeah. we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna remain different it is. and keep that, keep that to, to, true to everything that you do from technology to people to, to product. I think the stage we're at now is that we're still so new that we haven't really, we haven't even come to the stage where we set SOPs because 
it's everything is so new. We, we, yeah. we, we learn on the go, and if something works, then we implement it, and that's great. Yeah. But you know, it's taken me six months now to find two exceptionally fantastic area managers. Mm. I've never ever taken six months to hire anyone in my career prior to that. It's just not happened. Yeah. But I, I needed to find the right, right human beings with the right talent. One is an astute hotel, uh, uh, has an astute hotel background, uh, done portfolios before and so on. The other one doesn't even come from hospitality. Wow. That's, that's uh, this is, you know, she's a very, very like, guest service, guest centric focused person throughout her career where that's what we need. We need the diversity. Mm. And if we have the diversity, we have a, a, an opportunity and a, and a good chance for, su- for su- su- success. Yeah. That's a real call yeah. out of, of, of almost employing the person, not the CV. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah, what yeah. it's all about. Yep. It's not about, you know, you, 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 you know, again, it goes back to what I said before, you gotta spend a lot of time in your life at work. Yeah. Yep. You've got to be the right fit. You've got to feel the right, you've got to have the right feeling in, in your stomach when you go into a, you know, into a job. Yep. And if you don't have that, well, you're, then you might as well. You're in the wrong place. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions from, from the audience? Uh, you said something about how you're going to use more technology. <coughs> yep. And then you just hired a director of digital, digital marketing. marketing. Yep. What kind of strategies do you have Well, it's interesting because um, the businesses that we have is just not hotels. It's, it's you know, there's co-working, co-living, and all this stuff, and they've been started up at, this, at, at different yeah. stages. So they're all in different stages of their of their life cycle. So that's why we've actually hired her to actually come in and actually review where we are at and what we need to do to get to the next level. So she only just started with us yesterday, and that's that's another thing. It took us four months to find her. You know, wow. number of in, many many interviews, but she's just the right fit. And, and she will by, be able to dissect what we have spent money on, what we haven't spent money on, how to strategize and really work on that piece so that we can go to the owners and we can say, we need X amount. Can we please have this? Yeah. We would like for you to sign off on this and here's your ROI. You know? So, yeah. So, uh, I guess tech, everyone's talking tech now. Everyone wants to Everyone. be the, the, the next tech thing, right? Yeah. Um, I guess in... At what point do we do we say enough is enough in our industry? <laughs> one, and two, are we all going to be replaced by drones at one stage? In your opinion? Look, I, I think yeah, you know, AI is is massive everywhere. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Talk box, be that you know you you get on a computer screen and somebody says, "Hey, how are you going?" Yep. You know, and you go, "Oh, is that a real person?" And it's not. No. <laughs> so um, you know, um, I think. I think you know there's always going to be tools that everyone's going to use in the industry. Mm-hmm. It depends on how far you want to take it. We're nev- like in, at Veria, we'll never be replaced by drones. Yep. It, it is not the, the purpose of the organization. It, it, it's a purpose of making a personal connection with the person in front of you. Yep. That, that's, that, that's really our say um, and our why. Yep. Um, look, you, you know, you've all seen it. You've read all the articles. You've seen all the videos. You know, IHG has got, you know, robots making, you know, drinks. If you go on a cruise ship, you know, they make 9,000 drinks a night or whatever, you know, like, is yep. it efficient? Absolutely. Is it the way of the future? Absolutely. But right. it's not for everyone. Yep. So, you know, but AI is going to be based, you know, be, be part of any type of hotel business going forward for sure. So some these, way or these guys need to get their heads around AI at, at some stage and, and how to incorporate it into the, the service experience. Yeah, no, I think, you know, yeah. everyone's going to, you know, they will have to uh, think that at some stage you are going to be part of AI in one way or another. Yeah. And you might as well, I mean, I think you should embrace it. It's not that you shouldn't embrace it. You just got to determine if if um, what you see and what you hear is right, you know. Yeah. I'm not sure if you saw, but there was a robot that got married uh, a couple of months ago before Christmas uh, in, I think it was in one of the Emirates. Yep. And uh, that wasn't so much an issue for me. The issue for me was that she's now now not allowed to be turned off. <laughs> oh no! That's the only issue I have with yeah. it. Like, I, that is what it is. But it, I mean, it, you think about it. It's she's now married, oh, and yeah. she's technically a person. She's that's part it. Of the, part of society. That's it. So it yeah. puts things in in perspective, right? A uh, question for Lura: All the lifestyle hotels merging and the millennial millennials coming through and graduating and entering the workforce, do you think there'll be a shift towards younger GMs? Have they more aligned with the, 
the pit for lifestyle hotels. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's the process we're going through now with our restruct restructure as well. We're looking at that piece. It's not, you know, you don't need to be, you know, I don't want to say plus 30 or something like that to be a GM at all. You just need yeah. to have the right attitude. And, and what we're looking at now in, in Melbourne in particular is, is a, you know, a, a restructure where we are, we're going to give young up and coming, you know, people that's maybe had a, a bit of industry experience a chance to actually operate a 40 or 30 room hotel. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I mean, we were chatting about that a, a little while ago about mm. some of the opportunities that, that, that are there. Yeah. But I guess, I mean, you were 26 when you- when I was you, young when, too. When, yeah. when, you, when yeah. you first opened up. Yeah. Right? It's a really good question. I think it's, it's, it's for these guys to understand that, you know, sometimes students come into hotel management and they, they, they see the, the big luxury brands as thinking, ah, I'm gonna put all of my energy and, and, and try and get into a luxury brand. But the opportunities in lifestyle are, are really vast. And I think it's, it's just, a, you know, you, you see all the acquisitions of the bigger ones, they all buy each other, you know, and, and, yeah. and then what happens to the branch? You know, they're rebranded <laughs> to something else and yep. are they gonna continue to exist? So that's another question. I mean, I think, I think the important thing is that there's still space for the small nimble operator. Mm. You know, there has to be. Mm. And yes, now we've, you know, gone, gone overnight from five to 19 hotels and that's a big acquisition. But for us, it's not about, you know, just you making everything cookie cutter vary. It's about just, you know, we will retain the Pond Hill brand. We'll yep. work on that. We'll rebrand it. We'll refocus on it because in Melbourne, it has a very strong presence. Yep. Um, plus 30 years and, you know, a lot of corporate travelers knows that brand. So, you know, it's about mm -hmm. us finding our way around um, that that area, I think. so. And I guess Australia's embraced lifestyle, lifestyle brands. Of course. I think it really, yeah. it really suits out, like you put it, a kind of casual, laid back, yep. relaxed yep. Um, yep. lifestyle. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, no question. Uh, when, as may I say, one of the drivers of the, um, the trend of lifestyle and conventional um, establishments, may I say, where do you see um, the hotel industry moving on forward in terms of diversification of what we are offering to guests mm. in say, 10 years time? Oh, in 10 years time, wow. Yeah, look. <laughs> Get your crystal that's ball a, That's my crystal ball <laughs> moment. Um, <laughs> Look, I see a lot of AI mixed into that for sure. It's just a question of how far you want to take it. Yeah. But I, I look, the diversification of what you need to offer always has to be there. So the problem for the, the bigger operators now is that they can't change as fast as we can. Yeah. And so we got to retain ourselves at a size where we can still make the fundamental changes straight away. So if we see something we like, we buy it. If we see something we want to do, we do it, you know. And unfortunately for the bigger operators, they can't do that. No. They, you know, with hundreds of hotels, if they're gonna change a, a check-in procedure, it would have to go to corporate, which may be in Poland or maybe in London, or maybe, and it would take six months. And by that time, the employee who put forward the change is already gone. So it, it, that's, that's, that's really, you know, where the, the main difference for us is. And I, I think, you know, change is, is inevitable, you know? Mm. It, it, it's going to happen one way or another. It doesn't matter how you look at it. Um, growth, though, is manageable. So you got to de determine, yep. you know, where you want to go and how fast you want to go. How many of those innovations are actually coming from within? I think, uh, you know, if we look at all our offerings, we look at all the, the standards that we've, we have pushed through, um, yeah, they've all come from they've within. Come from within. They've all come from a point of view where an owner or founder or a family member, etc., has has had an experience in a in a different environment, and they yep. said, oh, "I cannot believe that we're spending so much money on staying at this hotel, and nobody cares about us." Yep. You know, or you feel almost intimidated. And I, I was talking to Anthony before. I, I had an experience, and we won't name the brand, but a very experience, uh, expensive experience in Melbourne the other day, and and I felt. I felt almost intimidated checking into the hotel when yeah. I thought, okay, I'm spending $400 with you. You could at least just smile at me and say, yep. you know, how was your day? But that's not part of the process, you know? No, not at all. So, yeah, you know, that's, that's, I think that's the vast difference really from us. We, we, um, we also, the very brand is, has to be perceived as a brand that, that gives you value for money. So yes, everyone knows Sydney is very busy, rates are up, everyone's happy. But down the track when, you know, uh, there's been a significant amount of, of, of rooms added in as an inventory from an inventory perspective into Sydney and, and the, the occupancies, they flatten a little bit. Yeah. Our target, you know, our goal and our incentive for our guests is that they want to come back because they feel there's a sense of value. 
you know, we're not going to charge them seven hundred dollars a night. We won't do it. And belonging as well. I belonging, mean, let's, of course, let's, let's of not course. Discount that. But it's it's all about people getting a personal connection with a team member yeah. or a tribes member, and 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 really just loving being in our space. It's taking hospitality back to its core, really. I it's, think it's, you're right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's what it used to obviously used to be around yeah. and about. So, yeah. Look, I guess on that point, I think we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. It's been absolutely amazing having right. you on, on, on today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, can you please put your hands together? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.